The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to talk about planting those fall bulbs as well as how to grow, grow great garlic by planting it in the fall. Our guest is author Leah Webb, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour's full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to another edition of the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Thank you so much for being part of the program, taking time out of your day to listen to us. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Happy you're tuning in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 AM or FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023 through our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Underneath the Season 7 tab at the top of the page, podcast replay, in-studio video replay, however you're listening, whenever you're listening, thank you very much for that. You can tune in, you can listen, you can be part of the program if you'd like by sending us an email to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call 24-7-365 toll-free coast-to-coast at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. Well, fall, Holly, is the time where many things of the garden goes away or gets done, but planting is still a project for several different items. Right, and that includes um, flower bulbs. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure, you want to figure out where you want to put these bulbs. But one thing you want to do, and if you've never planted bulbs before, maybe you planted and you weren't sure if what you did was right or you didn't like what you did or maybe you... It just didn't work. It just didn't work. Here's, we got some tips here for you. So, you know, well, you want to make sure you choose a spot that has at least six hours of sunlight. And we're not talking about right now. We're talking about during like the peak of summer. Um because a lot of these bulbs are okay for partial shade, but you just want to make sure that you are ensuring that they have at least six hours of sunlight per day. Um, so for things like daffodils or the early blooming ones, I think even like crocus, because it's a, an early blooming one, you don't necessarily have to worry about that because those will um, come out or what's the word I'm looking for? Pop, uh, bloom. Bloom blossom whatever um before the trees have the leaves so they're like a lot of times you know first first signs of spring you see the daffodils or you see the the crocuses so you don't have to worry about that but anything else you just want to make sure that you are giving at least six hours of sunlight well the daffodils you you always can figure that summer or that the spring the snow is pretty much over when those daffodils begin to pop yeah it's definitely a sign so you also want soil that is rich with organic matter or compost. Remember, you are planting something that no matter what you're planting, they need something to eat. Feed off Feed of. Feed off of, yeah. Um, so something that's rich in organic matter, compost, etc. cetera. Um, and then you also want to make sure they're well-drained soil because they are bulbs and they're going to sit in that soil for a while. So if the soil is too wet, if it's maybe too clay, something like that, over They will rot. Yeah, they will rot. You don't want that because you've... You don't likely purchase these bulbs or maybe somebody gave them to you and you don't want your bulbs to rot in the soil. So you want to make sure that you have um, you have well-draining fertile soil. And taking care of these, you know, doing the proper maintenance of the soil prep can ensure your bulbs to return many years. Daffodils can last many years in the same location. But if you have really bad soil or not enough light, uh, your limitations of expectations are going to be very short. Right. And that's the thing is that you do want to keep that in mind. You want to plant them properly. And um, there's this hillside. I don't know who owns the hillside. Not too far from here, but there's a ton of daffodils on there. And I'm always grateful for whoever planted them because they're nice to see in the spring. I kind of take it to on the way to one of these grocery stores that I go to. So then you also <clears throat> want to plant the bulb three times as deep as the bulb is tall. So okay. if your bulb is like two inches tall, you want to plant it 
the, so the bottom is six inches deep. Okay. Now, you can do this. You can plant bulbs in large containers. The traditional or more recommended and more assured that it's going to go is going to be planting them in the physical ground. By planting them in the native soil, if you have to add a little compost, you add a little compost. But that will guarantee that they will come up and come up correctly and come up every time. And the other thing is based on the type of bulb and when they will germinate, when they will blossom, you can set up a, a very unique design where it's kind of like uh, dominoes falling. The front ones uh, bloom and they fade away and the second ones bloom, fade away, you know, all the way back to the back. And if you're planting these bulbs in any type of configuration, you want to be aware of how tall they get because it's really nice and pretty to see a tulip. But if you got a tall flower in front of it, you're never going to see the tulip. So you need to keep aware yeah. of your, your height and, and how you're going to stagger these. And some these. of these like lilies and stuff, you want to to keep that in mind as well. Um, so when you get your bulbs, you might get them, maybe you have them already, or maybe somebody gave you them and you're not ready to plant them, or maybe you saw a really good deal and you ordered them and they're on their way, but it's still not ready. You want to put them in a plastic bag. If it comes in a plastic bag, that's fine. And then in a paper bag and put them in your fridge. This will prevent them from rotting and then keeping them in plastic will keep dirt out of your fridge right. and the paper just acts as like another layer. Now, we're not wanting to seal these up in a Ziploc bag. We want them to breathe, but we want to have just the, the protection of the, yeah. the dirt and yeah. bulbs. So yeah. the plastic bag that it comes in, usually when you get the bulbs, they come in a plastic bag that is just kind of loosely tied. Right. It's not super airtight. And that's, that's what you're going for. So... Uh, there's many different bulbs in which you can choose, and it's, it's based on your geographical area. There's some bulbs that are going to do much better in the north than the south and the east. And, and, and elevation, you may be in a, a portion of the country where you have a higher elevation that certain flowers are just not going to do as well as your neighbor who lives many feet below you. Right. Yep. So, so yeah, you want to to keep that in mind. So you want to plant when the nightly temperatures are around 50 40 to 50 degrees consistently or about six weeks before you expect the ground to freeze. Good luck with that guess. Yeah. At this point, it's really hard to say, but most people plant their bulbs like if you are in zone five like we are, it's usually October is right. when they, they plant them. And that's usually a good rule of thumb. You If you're not 100% sure and you're like, ah, things have been changing, shifting, you can always call your local garden center. You could always independent ask a garden center. Don't call the big box store because they won't know. Right. You can call. You can always phone a friend. Uh, maybe you have a neighbor who. Maybe the person who gave you the bulbs. Like when you plant these, and then you can plan that. Now one. I've heard and I've seen people plant bulbs. Yeah, you want to get them in before your first, but even in the first weeks in December, as long as you can, ch you're, you really want to get them in to get them established and kind of get them set for the spring. But if you are waiting or do not have time or find a deal on a deal on bulbs late in the season. You're, we're talking October, early November, mid December, and they're or mid November, and they're trying to dump this. As long as you can chisel it in the ground, get it in the ground. Yeah, I agree. You want to get them in the ground. The bulbs aren't going to do anything in your fridge. But again, don't rush to get them in the ground. Oh, I've got these bulbs. I got to throw them in the ground. Boy, I put them in a bad place. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, then you also want to keep in mind that you don't need to fertilize them now. You want to fertilize them in the spring. Right. Fertilize them now isn't really going to do anything. You're just going to basically waste your money in fertilizer. But fertilizing them in the spring allows for them to actually benefit from that fertilizer. Yeah. And uh, with all of these bulbs, it is good to know to hold on to the actual paper, the little tag that goes with it. Put it somewhere where it's not going to fade or get wet or get sun stained so you can learn or remember about these. Like, okay, they're supposed to come up at this time. Okay, they're supposed to be this tall. Some of the maintenance requirements of it. So you have a hard copy of it. Yeah, that's important too. And another thing is to keep in mind that there are bulbs that we don't plant all in the fall. There are things like dahlias and gladiolas. Those are planted in the spring. So if you know that a, bulb, that a plant is growing in the spring, that's what it means you plant it in the fall. If you know that the plant is growing in the summer, then you plant it in the spring. So you kind of have to think like you can do that planting too. Maybe you plant bulbs that are going to come up in spring and then come up in the summer and then you have a good use of of that particular bed and you get kind of the the color, the beauty, 
throughout the summer, but you want to keep in mind that just because you have the bulbs doesn't mean that planting them at your whatever time you think it should be. You want to be wise about it. Most are short-lived bulbs. Most uh, properties that are planted cake, cake, with flower take about three to five years. That's about the lifespan of some of these uh, bulbs. So you want to kind of rotate them, kind of know when you plant them, and, and kind of know the life expectancy is about that three to five year span. They're not going to last forever. They're not asparagus or a tree. So they're going to take – it's it's their cycle. That's just kind of what it takes to uh, maneuver and take care of the bulbs. And it's still you're going to have to maintenance. And once you plant these things, it's really best to make sure you make one move and not have to redig them up and plant them. Most flowering bulbs will not last more than a season in storage. So keep that in mind. If you forget to store them, if you if – you, I know when we get these questions a lot in the spring, I forgot I bought bulbs. They're in a bucket in the garage. They don't look good. What should I do with them? Put them in the ground, first of all. At least you got a chance. Yeah. There are some places and some situations where you put them in the freezer to uh, stratify them or, or put them through a cold cycle in order to think they went through the ground and you leave them in for a couple of weeks and then you plant them outside and you may get something out of them. But they're just like... For example, potatoes. You let potatoes sit in a shelf for a prolonged period of time, it's going to shrivel up, and it's not going to do much good for anybody. Well, anything else to add you want to No. Walton's does have something good for all of us, and that is they have everything that you need except for the meat. Absolutely. So we were brought to you today by our sponsors, Walton. We know you care about where your food comes from. Canning, preserving your fruits and vegetables is great, but what about the meat? We are coming upon hunting season here, and Walton says everything you need for to make, you know, whether it be um, sausage, jerky, any other meat product your way, they have the equipment seasoning, and they use Excalibur seasoning, which is what the professionals use, and they also have MeatJustics.com to help educate you on the hows and whys of meat processing, as well as the community of almost 15,000 users who will help you give do, their opinion. Do it right. Yeah, how to do it right and how to do it well so you can enjoy your uh, meat harvest. And Walton's has their own full line of meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. Walton's everything but the meat. You can use code grow code, use code grow 50, grow five zero to save 10% off your orders of $50 or more. That's waltonsinc.com. When we come back, it's all about fall garlic, what you need to do in order to get a good harvest next spring. You're tuned in to the Garden with Join Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Group 6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products to last a lifetime. They are built beyond tough. Their belts are minimalist and one-of-a-kind with no holes or flap hanging over. Designs and styles for men and women. Something for everyone. Versatile to mix and match fashionable buckles and belt webbing. Colorful or timeless designs to match your style. You know how bulky and uncomfortable a belt can be, but not a problem with the Grip 6 belt. Comfortable but durable, a belt that moves and works with you and your lifestyle. Perfect for all the bending, twisting, shifting, and moving during gardening, yard work, and all of your everyday life. It's almost like you're not wearing a belt at all. Design and manufacture an in-house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip 6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, walls, and socks at Grip6.com. Use code RADIO15 to save 15% off at Grip6. Com. Dripping Springs Oreos clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oreos, O L L A S, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. 
Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy-to-install pond and water fill kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit Aqua-Mart.com to shop for all your needs. When a family of fruit flies accompanies the fresh fruits and vegetables from your garden, you need rescue fruit fly traps. Rescue fruit fly traps use a food grade lure that fruit flies can't resist. And thanks to their no tip design, you won't have to worry about spills on your kitchen counters. Get rid of fruit flies fast with rescue fruit fly traps. Made in the USA by the makers of the popular rescue fly and yellow jacket traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us. Do you want to grow fall garlic? Well, plant garlic now and have great bulbs in the spring. Moments away, we're going to discuss that. But first, a word from our good friends at Farmer's Defense. Farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves to made to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, outdoor worker, uh, forester, tree chopper, etc. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves offer cooling comfort and protection against the elements outdoors. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense is made of wicking material with UBF protection factor 50 Plus, to protect you from allergens and scratches, you can find all their great products and more at FarmersDefense.com. Joey loves them. Yeah, when you're cutting wood or you're picking berries, you don't get your arms all scraped up. However, do note that when you play with your cat, it doesn't have the same effect. <laughs> no. It, it, it doesn't. The, the burrs of the, the blackberries and raspberries or the tomato vines, uh, the leaves doesn't irritate your hands, but... Uh, our, our our cat text, he'll just right into him and uh, doesn't stop it. So keep that in mind. That's probably not what they're designed for no, is kitty no, protection. I don't, I don't so. think so. But, you know, in case it, maybe we're saving somebody who's going to try it with their own yeah, cat. Yeah, we've done it so you don't have to. Exactly. So planting garlic, there is people who grow garlic in the spring and harvest it in the fall. Elephant garlic is done that way. Some people do hard neck and soft neck garlic that way. We attempted to do garlic that way, and it has never worked out very well. The bulbs are li- literally half to three quarters the size of what the bulb is if we planted it in the fall and harvested in early spring. Right. So, yeah, so you want to plant your garlic in the fall? Well, you, you can get your garlic from Jung Seeds, from Jung Seeds, J-U-N-G-S-E-E-D dot com, and you can use coupon code 10 TG23 to save 10% on your order at junkseed.com and they are returning in 2024 for season 8 of the program. Just a side note, thank you for their support. You can get hard neck and soft neck. There is no wrong variety. There's not it, it, what which is better. Well, hard neck grows better in the north. Soft neck is more prominent in the south. However, there is successful gardeners who grow soft neck in the north. The benefit to hard neck is you get escape. Right. You get a, a bonus harvest. I think it. that's I think that's probably one of my like favorite things. Not that I don't think we grow any soft neck, but I like the scapes. I get excited for for the scapes, and it's something to kind of look forward to. Even though you know here where we are in zone five, our scapes come in in June, so it's we're kind of at the beginning of summer. But it's it's something to look forward to either way. So. um yeah, so soft neck does not provide the scapes. Hard neck does, and soft neck um, doesn't have the stem through the middle. Hard neck does, and then when I think hard, it's a soft neck st- stores a little bit longer. Yeah, but yeah. when a soft neck is ready, it falls over. When hard neck is ready, the lower leaves die off, and the plant progressively dies up. Now, you want to plant your hard neck or your soft neck garlic in the fall, approximately thirty days before your first hard freeze. Good luck with that guess. The Per principle of that is to get the bulb in the ground two to four inches and get it established. Get some roots coming off of that clove in which you're planting. Now, you're not planting the whole bulb. You're going to get seed garlic bulb 
or seed garlic, which comes in a bulb, and you're going to break it apart just like you're going to cook with it. The larger the clove will guarantee will highly give you a higher probability of a large bulb come harvest time. You can plant small bulbs too, or small cloves too, and you'll get moderate size bulbs. So whenever you, if you've already harvested garlic, you want to look for the largest bulbs that will contain the largest cloves in which you can plant. You don't want to break these open until about 48 hours in, when you intend to plant them because they will dry out. When you break them off of the bulb, the clove, the largest clove that you're wanting to plant, do not remove anything off of that clove. Don't remove the skin off of it. You want to leave it intact as a protective barrier for when you plant it. You'll plant it. We always plant ours the first Saturday uh, of October in our Zone 5 garden, and we typically harvest it late June, early July in that same time for, in that in the following year. So it does take up a lot of real estate, but you don't have to let it take up part of a raised bed. You can plant this in the flower beds around your house very easily, and it will do just as well. Right. There's lots of, there's lots of um, sneaky little places you can put some garlic. And it yeah, does want full sun. Though. It does want full sun. That's something to keep in mind. We're not talking about full sun um, in the spring. When the leaves talking, are not we're, there. <laughs> we're talking about full sun up until you're going to harvest it, which is, it's about nine months. And, and with the hard neck, you want to remove the scape after you see it curl about four, three to four weeks before you begin, before you dig it up. Right. So then you want to... Um, one month before your first hard freeze, that's hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. We plant ours October 1st-ish. Yeah. I just went over that. Right. So that's... that's uh, Yeah, that's and you can't thing. accelerate the germination to help it out by soaking it in a compost tea, a manure tea, just water for about 24 hours before you intend to plant it. I So... Yes. I feel like... I don't know. I don't. I don't think that soaking is always necessary. No, it's not. And I don't know if if people understand that that it's not. It's not a. It's not like a bad. Like you're not wasting your time if you do it, Correct. but you're also not inhibiting the growth of your garlic or whatever seed. Well, you're, if you're you do do it. if you hydrate it with water or an uh, uh, inhibitor or, 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 or uh, like a fertilizer, like a compost tea, let's say, and you soak corn for two, three hours and get it fully hydrated and plump before, and, and peas or beans, you can ex, you can jumpstart it by about three days quicker. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. But like, there is or, a, there's or a or lot of step. Like, I know. Even like in okra, people soak it in milk or whatever. Milk to get the uh, hardened, to soften the hardened shell of the okra. Oh, okay. The lactic acid in the whole milk helps break down that hard shell that the okra okay. has. So this makes sense for small seeds, correct? Right, or smaller yeah. seeds. For garlic, I just don't see. The you can, point. yeah. It's by, we've done it both ways, right? Now we've not said, oh, that was soaked. That is absolutely better than <laughs> non soaked. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm just saying that you any seed, any seed where you're like, oh, I was going to soak these and I forgot. Well, the problem with peas is you got you got to know how much you're going to use because if you don't calculate right, you've got like 37 seeds that you've soaked. Now you got to plant because they're no good otherwise. Well, and that's kind of for any, any yeah, seed that yeah. you're going to I mean, we've made that mistake with peas before. But with the garlic, you want to get it in the ground 30 days before your first freeze. If you get it in a little earlier, that's fine. If you begin to see it grow, do not panic. That's okay. You're, you may have two, three, four inches of growth above soil level, even though you've planted it two to four inches deep, before it goes into dormancy, before it freezes, before the snow Especially, falls. Especially, that's the thing is like here... In our in our zone five, um, I just like to remind people what zone we're in. Right. Um, we we'll see it, you know, come up in December, mm -hmm. and this and some people will they'll just because we've been having these kind of warmer falls, they'll wait till December to plant their garlic. Right. We're not going to do that. We don't really recommend that you do that either. But um, it's it is an option. Maybe you get more garlic or something. You want to do that? No, but, we've never mulched our garlic. No. And we've had some of the harshest winters uh, in the last 10 years that we believe that we've been told on record has ever had happen in our area, and they've done just fine. So mulching, the only benefit to mulching is it maybe suppress some of the weeds in the spring, 
But if you mulch incorrectly, you can inhibit the growth of your garlic trying to per, per, uh, penetrate through all that mulch. Right. And so we made that mistake. We made, well, we made a lot of mistakes. Well, yeah. But, when we started, yeah. And we, because we planted the spring, we pl- I think we planted it probably too deep. We put like two feet of straw over uh-huh. it. So, yeah, we made that mistake. But definitely, if you don't need to mulch it or if you don't want to mulch it, don't worry about it. If you want to mulch it, maybe like an inch of mulch max. I, that would be it. Um, you can use leaves or something. Maybe you have some extra leaves that you just want to put around it. Go for it. Um, but mulching is not necessary. It is not. And it can, uh, be more of a a detriment than a benefit. And then you want to fertilize or side dress your garlic in the spring once the winter has gone bye bye. And you can use just compost tea. You can use a liquid fertilizer. You can put compost around it. You want to keep it watered because as the spring soil warms, you will see this garlic rapidly race to the sky in order to start growing. And you, we've never had to water our garlic in the spring. It's always We've always had very wet springs. So if you are in a climate in which drought or dryness in the spring can occur – irrigation watering is a must for garlic because the that's when it's really going that's when it's starting to figure out that you know get it photosynthesis get the bulb developing properly and large and by doing this you will have really good garlic if you want a step-by-step visual tutorial on how to do all this you can go to our parent website which is the wisconsin vegetable and in the upper right corner there's a search bar and just type in planting garlic we've got like eight or twelve different uh tutorials on how to plant garlic in the fall we've even got one in the spring and how miserable that was so there's a lot of a uh, lot of information on the website we've only got a short amount of time here to cover an hour worth of topic in a single a block here of time on the show right so you can check out our website or you can send us a an email yeah, garden talk radio at gmail.com yeah we can help you out well holly the uh if you are dealing with a need to control beetles and grub invaders without affecting the rest of your ecosystem in your yard then grub gone and beetle gone is the solution <laughs> Phylums Grub Gone and Beetle Gone target a wide range of invasive and destructive beetles, weevils, and borers without harming non-targets such as bees, ladybugs, butterflies, earthworms, or other beneficial insects. You can purchase these products locally in Massachusetts at Ward's Nursery, McHugh Garden Center, and Hyannis Country Gardens, in Connecticut at Van Williams Garden Center, in Maine at Salisbury Organics, in New York at Fadigan's Nursery, and in Ohio at Berlin Seeds. You can go to phylumbioproducts.com to find out more. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Target the pest, not the rest. When we come back, author Leah Webb will be with us. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit blueribbonorganics.com. When I commit to someone, I want them to commit back to me for, you know, life. That's why I love, love Verlo mattress. When you buy a Verlo, you get something nobody else offers, a commitment to helping you love your sleep for as long as you own your mattress with a lifetime comfort guarantee. Those other places, eh, you get a measly 60, 90, maybe 120 nights. Not even close, guys. Wake up, sleep better. Verlo. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Going on vacation and can't find a plant sitter? Check out Tree Diaper. It can provide perfect soil moisture for plants for weeks, even months. Use coupon code GARDEN15 to save 15% off at TreeDiaper.com. Are you bugged by bugs? You need naturally green products, no more bugs, environmentally friendly, made in the USA. No More Bugs is a cedar blend that repels and eliminates mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, and more. No More Bugs is safe for you, your pets, and plants. 
Visit nomorebugs.net for free shipping on orders over $50. Use code FREESHIP for me. Fleet Farm has everything you need to get ready for the canning season. Pick up all your supplies from start to finish as you begin to harvest your garden. Choose from an assortment of jars, strainers, racks, and funnels. Plus, check out the wide selection of mixes, sugar, vinegar, and more. Get what you need for your everyday life, including canning, at new lower prices. Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. Beer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep beer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua-Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Join Holly Radio Show. Moments away, Leah Webb will be with us. But first, a word from Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles before it hits your patio, your plate, harvest veggies and herbs and greens you need for dinner tonight on the comfort of your home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app. Step by step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf and comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences for more information. And to get a Rise Garden, visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Leah is passionate about helping people nourish themselves with whole foods. She's a cookbook author of the Sugar-Free, Grain-Free, and Dairy-Free Family Cookbook and garden writer of the Seven Step Homestead. She's also a garden consultant, speaker, and a mother. Welcome to the program, Leah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day, not only to educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. And I'll start with this. There's a lot of buzzwords around food these days. What are whole, what is whole foods? What are whole foods? What where does that fall into it? And, and explain that. To answer that as simply as I can, I would say that it's using ingredients that have been minimally processed. And if you want to simplify that even more and give yourself some criteria as to what it is that that actually means, it means to be cooking with ingredients that have basically come directly from the farm. So this means you're cooking from scratch, using ingredients that are um, that are as close to the things that we were probably using 200 years ago before the invention of packaged processed foods. Well, and now the next, the follow-up would be to people whom just, uh, you know, how easy is it to uh, get a hold of these products that are considered whole foods without breaking That's the a- bank? That's a great question, and there, it's a complicated answer because some of it depends on economics and whether or not you're able to afford these things, and where is your geographic location, and are these foods actually available to you where you live? Some of us live in regions where we have great access to farmers markets that have also been connected to programs such as WIC and and SNAP benefits. And so they've made some of these wholesome foods more available to a wider um, consumer base, but it's just not possible for everybody. Um, So for my family, I've used a lot of strategies such as cooking in bulk, um, purchasing foods in bulk, maintaining a garden, uh, which gardening is not necessarily always a money saver. Um, Investing in things like chickens and things like that can still be costly. And um, so it's really... Having access to whole foods and having these ingredients requires some money, some actually living in a place where you have access, and then also requires time to be able to invest in cooking those things. Um, But I will say that meal planning, purchasing foods in bulk, 
planning ahead and knowing what it is that I'm going to be feeding my family are some of the best tools in order to make these whole foods meals show up on the table more often for us. Well, and people whom may not be financially capable or locational wise in order to fully get whole foods, one, do the best you can, and two, start looking at what's in what you're buying. You will figure out a way if it, it some of this stuff is scary, first of all, and, and that what you're eating, and Holly and I are guilty of it. You know, it tastes great, but it's probably going to kill us. Um, but <laughs> yeah. people are, just read the label, first of all, I think is the, the beginning steps. Yeah, reading the labels and seeing if the ingredients are even pronounceable and recognizable. For example, you can buy one brand of cracker and the ingredients will be salt and wheat or uh, hopefully the other way around, wheat and salt. Uh, you can buy another ing list, you can get another brand of cracker and there will be 15 to 20 ingredients on there, mainly ones that you can't actually pronounce. Absolutely. And then even from brand to brand for a similar item, similar ingredients. Some are just chock full of sodium, like added sodium, or just like if you look at pasta sauce, there's so much added sugar in some of these brands. And um, yeah, I think even for me, I know I read labels just comparatively. If a, a jar of pasta sauce is three dollars versus three fifty. Like maybe that fifty cents is worth it, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. You also bring up a good point because often when we go to the grocery store, many of us are buying the same items every single time, right? We kind of have our default items that we go to. And so if you do take that extra time to pick out the brand that fits within your criteria for your ingredient list and within your price range, then you can just keep buying that brand again and again. We're Humans are creatures of habits. We definitely tend to do the same thing again and again. I, I, I agree. So you refer to yourself as a solutions-based family food and garden coach. What What is that? And then how did you get into doing that, um, the, the coaching? Yeah, so with fo family food and garden coaching, I try to support families in making practical changes to their lifestyles through meal planning and gardening. What I have found is that Families especially are incredibly busy and we need solutions to actually reach our goals. You can say that you'd like to eat more whole foods or that you'd like to be in the garden or that you'd like to be exercising more, drinking more water, moving more, all of these things. But we really need solutions and and um, very specific ways that we're going to reach those goals. And so what I help families do is actually find, identify their goals, and then help them make small yet impactful lifestyle changes to reach their goals. Uh, one of the things that I always like to encourage people to do is look at where they want to be and then just pick a couple of things to change at a time. So when we pick this big lofty goal and we shoot for the moon and then all of a sudden we become overwhelmed because it's too much work to get there we find ourselves right back in those old habits that we were trying to kick and so if we're able just to focus on a couple of things at a time then we tend to be far more successful in the long run. Um, so that's what I mean by these small yet impactful lifestyle changes. Um, and I actually got into this because I've taught for quite some time. I have a bachelor's in biology, a master's of public health, and um, taught biology and gardening through both of those programs that I went through and then completed a health coach certification in 2012, which is the same year that I became a mother. Uh, shortly after my son was born, we realized that he had some food sensitivities. And, and then as he became older, we realized that he had some true allergies. Um, it used to be a fairly long list of foods that we carried an EpiPen for to, you know, guarantee that he, you know, if he ate the wrong thing, he could end up in the hospital pretty immediately. Um, and so you can imagine that really impacted my relationship with food seeing how, yes, you need to be eating healthy, but that we also had to enforce some restrictions that were going to keep my son alive and well. Um, and then after my daughter was born, uh, she was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic disease that impacts the lungs and pancreas. And part of her care requires that she takes more frequent antibiotics 
compared to the general population. Um, and so as a mother to a child with asthma and allergies, we know that this is an inflammatory response from the immune system. Um, and we know that much of the immune system is initiated in the gut, in the digestive tract. Um, and so all of these microbes that exist within our microbiome are incredibly beneficial to us. Um, and so then also having a daughter who is taking antibiotics a little bit more frequently than I may have liked, I really turn to food as a way to further support their health and try to provide them with the most nutrient dense diet that I possibly could. Um, so I was a, I was graduating with my health coach certification, um, coming into this world of motherhood, you know, had taught for many years and, and just started to realize how important it was for families especially, and many of us are dealing with different health challenges and how important it was for us to find solutions that we could actually execute on a daily basis to help support the health of our families. Um, and then gardening really came in because people have a difficult time executing all of these things they should be doing. And they always are feeling like I should be doing this and I should be doing that and I should be doing this. And what I found is that when you got people interested in gardening, they were automatically engaged in those healthier habits in a way that was fun. So they were outdoors, they were engaging with nature, they were moving their bodies, they were bending and lifting and squatting and doing all of the things that you have to do to plant a garden. And then the byproduct is that you're harvesting some of the freshest foods that you've ever had. Um, and so now I really focus on teaching gardening because uh, gardening and meal planning, just because I feel like those techniques alone give people the tools to start embarking on this healthier journey that, that just really can change their lifestyle over a long term. Fantastic. That sounds really great. So you have two books. One is the sugar free. It's a cookbook, the sugar free, grain free and dairy free family cookbook. And then you also have the seven step homestead. If you could tell us briefly about more about them and maybe kind of like a, a teaser from each about them, why our listeners should, should look into either or both of them. Yeah, so lo and behold, both of my books have to do with systems. Um, I am a solutions-based coach, and so I like to help people find systems that break larger tasks down into smaller ones. Um, and so my cookbook is about the diet that we followed pretty strictly for about four years to help treat the conditions that my kids were dealing with. Um, so that was grain-free, sugar-free, and dairy-free. And what I found with that is that I was always in the kitchen and I wanted to have more time to engage in some of the other activities that I was interested in doing. And so I, over time, developed a system of meal planning and prep that involves freezing foods, cooking in bulk, finding time to cook when it's actually convenient, and then using whole foods ingredients in a way that was also simple, right? So not necessarily having to spend loads and loads of time in the kitchen while also producing nutrient dense foods for your family that are delicious. Um, and so my cookbook is really about that system of meal planning and prep and those simple nutrient dense recipes that I was feeding my family. And you don't necessarily have to follow that specific grain free, dairy free, sugar free diet in order to benefit from this book and the recipes that are in it. Um, and then with my homesteading book, The Seven Step Homestead, this is also a system because what I learned from doing consultations with people for many years, garden consultations, is that everyone saw the end goal of these gorgeous homesteads that they see on Instagram and Facebook. And, and what they don't realize are how many steps went into that in order to create that amazing garden or homestead and how many failures that all of these amazing gardeners and homesteaders have 
encountered along the way. And so with the seven step homestead, I have basically taken the garden that I have, the small, I call it a micro farm or a micro homestead. Um, I'm not full blown homestead over here. I'm, I'm only working on about three quarters of an acre. Um, and I've basically taken that and broken it down into seven manageable steps that each one of them includes a different skill set. And so, for example, when you start the book, you start with two small raised beds. And I just give you the information that you need to execute that step. Once you master your two small raised beds, then you can expand into 400 square feet. Um, and then by the end of all of these steps, you've got chickens, fruits, berries, you've got four season growing and, and all of these diverse things that you can add to your homestead. Well, let's talk about, uh, let's go back to the um, whole foods thing for a minute, m moment. If someone is going to start working towards a whole food lifestyle, what is an unexpected challenge they may face and how is, could they overcome that or how can they overcome that without feeling defeated? I think the number one challenge that I see people face is that the that time period that precedes meal times that like 30 minutes to an hour right before you're supposed to be eating is often the worst time to be cooking right this is when we're either first waking up in the morning or we're away from the house at lunch or right when everybody has gotten home from work and none of these periods are often good it's usually a very hectic time, especially if you have kids. And so the solution that I have found that I think works for most people is to find a window of time to do as much prep work as you can that works for your schedule and is convenient. Um, and I think what people will be surprised to find is that there are a number of tasks that can be performed in advance, such as washing and chopping vegetables, um, cooking meats. Some of these things can even be frozen and then pulled out of the freezer later on, whether it be weeks or even a couple months down the road. Um, and so I think that identifying when is the most opportune time to be cooking, whether that's Saturday morning, nighttime, you know, it, it varies for everybody. Find that time and do as much prep work in advance as you possibly can. That's some really great, helpful advice. Um, so how we've really enjoyed having you on the program, Leah. How can people find out more about you, your great information, all the good stuff? Yeah, they can find me on Instagram and Facebook as Leah M. Webb, and I'm also LeahMWebb.com. And then they can find information about the Seven Step Homestead and the Grain Free, Sugar Free, Dairy Free Family Cookbook through my website, or it's available through most of the major book retailers. And then you can also find me throughout the country doing events such as Mother Earth News Fair and then some of the other gardening and homesteading events. Well, Leah, thank you so much for the time you've offered us and the education you provided uh, for Holly and myself and all of our listeners. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure getting to speak with you both. Thank you. And when we come back, it's going to be your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Tree hugger sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent 
independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers, and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit RootMaker.com and use coupon code RADIO23 to save 15% off your order at RootMaker.com. Chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long. Whether your garden is big or small, Chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing, weed, and pest control watering and seeding you can find chapin products at your local hardware store big box retailer you may visit them also online at chapinmfg.com to learn more and buy online make watering easy dripworks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the u.s and canada purchase online at dripworks.com Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG23 to receive 10% off your order at jungseeds.com. Again, that coupon code is 10TG23. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED, Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. It's time for your garden questions and our garden answers. If you've got a question, fire it on over here at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or give us a call to 1-800-927-SHOW. That's toll-free, coast-to-coast, 1-800-927-7469. This question is brought to you by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. My jack-o'-lantern pumpkins are ripe now. What can I do if I don't want to harvest or want them ready? Because I want them ready in a month or so to carve for Halloween. Well, month or so, yeah, beginning of October. Uh, Number one, learn from this year for next year. Plant a little later. And then um, there's a couple of things in which you can do in order to get them to last as long as possible. One, leave them on the vine as long as you can without getting them, without them starting to rot on the vine. That's number one. Um, number two, if you're concerned about animals getting to them while they're on the vine, coat them with WD-40. It'll kind of protect, put a te- protective barrier around them and will kind of potentially ward off insects and or animals trying to eat them, squirrels, uh, mice, rats, whatever you may have in your area. If you need to harvest it, keep it in a cool, dry place, about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, with good ventilation. So a shelf in a basement, um, and that's about all that we can do at this point, is uh, offer you that advice. You can certainly grow them later on in the season next year, figure out where you're at now, and then kind of start two and a half, maybe three weeks later. And, I mean, the the problem with that is, Holly, is, okay, I'm going to plant later, but oftentimes we may get an early frost and the thing's not ready yet. And it's really a gamble. And so I guess you kind of just have to, you know, nature, nature sets the schedule, yeah. unfortunately. All right. Next question here. Uh, we're going to go to a listener from uh, Michigan. Here we go. Good morning. This is Ilona out of Highland, Michigan. I listen to you on Wham Radio 1600. My question is, um, I am a first-time Brussels sprouts grower in my garden, and I have already snipped the tops off, and they're starting to form the little bulb on the side. I was wondering if I need to also remove all the leaves on the stalk. Um, Thank you very much. Okay, so... You thank you for listening to us uh, out of Southeast Michigan. Uh, you you did the right thing. You've listened to the program. She's been a long time listener, and we appreciate that. Uh, 
she topped the Brussels sprout off about 45, 60 days before you want to harvest it. That's going to stop the vertical growth and start putting on or stressing the plant out and putting on the bulblets. You don't want to remove any leaves. That plant still needs that leaf structure for, for photosynthesis in order to do the, the thing that it needs to do with the sun. So uh, leave it alone. It'll be fine. Now, if you have some dead leaves at the bottom of the plant, yeah, go ahead and you can pull them off. That's not going to be a problem. But don't touch the green leaves on the plant because the plant needs them uh, to fully complete the development of the sprouts. All right. When growing Jerusalem artichokes, do you harvest the full patch to stop them from taking over? I've planted what I thought was a dead and door, door, there's a doornail one in the ground, and now they are a 12 by 12 foot patch of them. And I'm starting to worry that they're going to get completely out of control and take over areas I do not want them to. Well, well, good. um, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But now, it's now, also, first scary. of all, what are Jerusalem artichokes or sun chokes? Sure. So, Jer- Jerusalem artichokes, sun chokes, whatever you want to call them, are a root crop. They are kind of like a, um, uh, they kind of a potatoy flavor, maybe mixed with a carrot. But they don't have the starch. But they don't have the, they're not as starchy, no. And they're related to the sunflower and dahlia plants. They do put on a very beautiful flower if you're, if they do, if the flower is able to, um, grow. And they're, uh, perennial, so they do come back year after year. So that's quite some growth for, from some, from some sun chokes. Uh, I would just suggest pulling them out as much as possible. They are going to keep growing. Unfortunately, yes. they're going to come back. But if that's too much for you, you can always just t- cut off the tops once they start sprouting. Well, whenever in, in our patch, we've had it going for about eight, ten years. Some years, phenomenal. Other years, like this year, not so much. It's in an, a non-irrigated area. And in the years that it's really, really good, they do expand a little bit. They do en- encroach on the other portions of the garden. But in the springtime... We will go in and cut a perimeter or dig out those plants that are starting to come up. Early on in the spring, you can harvest those tubers and still use them as you would in the fall after the frost has occurred like you would normally harvest them. So you can control them that way. And if you're in an area where you do not want these things to uh, encroach on anything, you can plant them in large containers. I mean, I'm talking half whiskey barrels or even larger, and you can harvest half the patch and leave the other patch, other half in the barrel or in the container to regrow and fill out the rest of the the, the area. Uh, it's it's an acquired taste, I guess you would say, if you never had Jerusalem artichokes. We've done it where we've taken it. The key to Jerusalem artichokes, whether you're making Jerusalem artichoke relish or you're putting them in a stew or crock pot, or you're air frying them, coated in olive oil, remove the skin get the skin off. No matter what you think or how hard you scrub, that's still going to have a certain amount of earthy dirt taste by pulling the the skin off. It really makes a difference. I do want to note they have this enzyme in them called inulin, not insulin. It's called inulin. And it does give you gas. It it will it, it, give it affects you gas. It different people. Yeah, but it, it, if I think if you are prone to being a gassy person, uh-huh. it probably amplifies that. Okay. I'm not trying to be gross or weird or funny. I'm just somebody's like, going. Hey, this <laughs> sounds fun. I'm just letting you know because I don't want you to grow these, and all of a sudden you got like rumble guts, and you're like, uh-huh. what is going on? Right. And you know your your spouse is leaving you, making you sleep in a different room. Who knows? So I just wanted you to keep that in mind. You can take does, that however you, you can, want. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. But I'm just saying that you want to keep that in mind. So if you do grow these and you're not sure how your intestinal tract will react, um, I've never had any sort of like adverse bathroom situations. It's just the, the uh, you know. Well, if you've never it's grown like, them. It's like the musical fruit, right? right. If you've never grown so, them yeah. in the fall here, is now is a good time to go to like a natural food store because those places will have Sometimes some. Sometimes even farmer's markets. Farmer's though. markets, yeah. right. You're not going to find these at the big supermarkets. No. These are not transportable. They, they just don't last. But I just I just want to let yes. people, people know that. But they are delicious. And yes. like Joey mentioned, the stews, um, I put them in with the roast once and they were just so buttery tasting. I don't know what, what happened but with the... get the skins off. Yeah, but... The, uh, the french the fries are good, too. Yeah. Or we slice them, we, we peel them, and then, uh, and then cut, we, um, cut them as chips, cut, coat them in vo- olive oil, and then We air fermented fry them. some, too. We fermented some, right. We pe- was that good or no? For us, remember. no. No, it was not good. For us, no. But okay, don't do that. No. 
<laughs> for, for us, it wasn't that great, but for others, it may be wonderful. But it's a unique crop that not everybody grows or not everybody is familiar with, or there's a certain group. I've heard of them, but I've just never touched them or had them or experienced them. Right, right. And and, and we grow the white variety. There is an Auburn or, or a Burgundy do, where variety. Where do we get those from? Uh, online seed catalog oh, okay. many yeah. years ago. Oh, yeah. When, when my niece was born, when our niece was born, I remember I ordered them that day from some online place. On the same day that I was waiting for her to oh to be born, so you were online shopping back then. I was really. I think I called over the phone, but <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Back in the day, you back used to have to talk to somebody in order to order something. It, you know, I had some time to kill, so I was ordering stuff and doing whatever else I could. Well, with that being said, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it, you can certainly do such by going to our parent website, which is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and clicking on the Season 7 tab at the top of the page, or send us an email, GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com, and uh, we can send you a link or just send an email telling us where you're listening from. We'd love to hear from you. Tune in next week to the program where we will be discussing winterizing your garden, as well as the world of apples and pears and what you can do with them, whether you have a whole bunch of them or you're going to go to one of those pick your own farms and they make you do the work and then you pay them for it. Our guest is garden nerd Christy Willingham. That's her title. I'm not insulting her. And we'll answer your garden questions. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.